All right. Hey, hey, y'all. My name is Jaya Douglas, and today I would like to introduce Mr. Jamarcus King. It's a local company here in Hamptons Road that handles all your IT goods and various IT um, solutions or problems. But yeah, I'll pass it on to Mr. King so he can explain more what he does and what his company does. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jamarcus King. As she was saying, I am the Chief Operating Officer for JNF Alliance Group. And today I'm here to I guess talk to you kind of about the entrepreneurial journey from years ago to where I am today. So I'm, I'm glad to do that because uh, it has been a journey. It's a, that's exactly what it is when you're in business for yourself. And um, it's a, I always like to try to share knowledge and tips to help the next person kind of avoid some of the pit holes, obstacles, and things like that that we face as we started our journey to get to where we are today. So I'm glad to be here. So um, our company is JNF Alliance Group. We're headquartered in downtown Hampton, Virginia. Uh, we specialize in software development. We have a specialty in augmented reality, virtual reality development, um, as well as some machine learning, artificial intelligence. intelligence. We do traditional software development and mobile app development as well at our facility. Um, everything is done in-house. Nothing's farmed out to overseas or India. All of our staff are located at our facility. All of our graphic designers, modelers, all of our programmers. We do have some out-of-state programmers. Uh, we do also have employees that work on site at the government facility for some of our government contracts. Uh, providing machine learning and artificial intelligence custom algorithm development. So I'll definitely talk to you more about that as I go through my presentation. So my background, um, my background is military. I actually joined the military in the 11th grade. I knew exactly, well, you know, I'll just be upfront and straight with you all today. So um, my stepdad, was a total jerk growing up. And all I wanted to do was I know I wanted to get out of the house. I wanted to get away from them. I had uh, two brothers, it was four of us. I had, two, my mom had two boys and two girls. So me and one of my sisters were from a previous relationship. And then my other brother and sister was by my stepdad. So we were in an environment where we got treated totally differently. And looking back on it today, um, I understand how important mental health is because um, I went one way with it and my sister suffered in another way with it, you know, starting to run away from home and, you know, getting into trouble and drugs and things like that. So um, I thank God that I was able to take that negative energy and use it in a positive way. It was kind of like, it was like fuel for me. I was like, man, I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna take care of myself. <laughs> I'm going to start my own life. I'm going to, you know, do what I got to do, you know, in this world. So that's kind of how that started. So in the 11th grade, I joined the military. So my mom, of course, you know, had to meet with me and the recruiters and sign me in. So I knew what I was going to do. So when everybody else was like, man, what are you going to do when you graduate? I already knew I was going into the Army. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm already in the United States Army. What? Yeah, I already sworn in and everything. I'll leave right after we graduate. So um, long story short, right after we graduated, I went right into the military. Um, first duty station, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, I enjoyed military is the best kept secret. Let me tell you that now. A lot of people don't realize it, or they may have different opinions based on what they hear. But the military is a great start for anybody coming out of school as a young adult. I'm telling you, you really find out who you are in that process. You start to learn what you like, don't like, and what, what journey you want to take for, as far as like a career industry. You just learn a whole lot. So I encourage all my kids to go in. Um, I got four and only one listen. So he's at Fort Hood, Texas right now. And he's actually, uh, I, I call him my son. He, he was from my, my um, previous relationship. So he was already there. He was actually my stepson at the time, but he still calls me dad today. So he listened, he's like, man, dad, I should've listened to you a long time ago. I could have been in and been out by now. Um, but I did not go to college. I have taken college courses online, um, different certifications, things like that. And um, after I got out of the military, I did six years active duty. When I got out of the military, I worked, as, I worked for the government. 
doing the same thing I did when I was in the military, except now I make six figures. You know, hint, hint. So again, the military is a great setup, I'm telling you. Benefits, um, you know, the special preferences you get on certain job opportunities. If you're a veteran, you kind of get a preference over other people. If there, if there is a government job you're trying to go to, they, they have like this rating scale. You get preference points. You might get like 10 points more. So that kind of helps you beat out your competitor who's also applying for that position. There are a lot of benefits and perks for being a veteran, I'm telling you. So um, I worked for the government for like nine years after I got out of the military. But in that process, I've had several entrepreneurial journeys uh, throughout my military, while I was in the military, when I got out of the military, all the way on up to today. So I can tell you, I got a lot of different stories, good and bad, <laughs> uh, when it comes to being an entrepreneur. So who is JNF? Um, I was kind of talked about that already. We specialize. We're basically a small business. A technology company located in Hampton Roads. Uh, we service both government and enterprise companies. Um, we've been in business since 2013. We love what we do. Um, we are a woman-owned, minority-owned, service disabled veteran-owned firm. We have top secret clearances, so my entire development team has top secret clearances. So when we do do work for the government, we're all clear to that level. Uh, we also have, we're part of the NASA Technology Transfer Program, where we take technology from NASA and we try to commercialize it into, and, and incorporate it into our services and products. Um, that's been a very good success for us. Uh, we have a slew of government certifications that kind of help us out too as being a small business. And uh, we're, all, we're excited about all of that. So current and previous customers, um, our customers range, you know, like I said, government, commercial, uh, we currently have a contract with the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, but we have data scientists working on site, providing services to them. Uh, we've done a lot. We've, we've worked with uh, Hunting and Ingalls, shipbuilding, providing like virtual reality, augmented reality for training, maintenance, uh, data visualization. Imagine being able to visualize something before you build it, right? Um, or imagine you never being or never train on a piece of equipment and you can walk up to it with a headset or your mobile device and point your phone at it and be guided through step-by-step -step work instructions. You know, and you now can perform at that same level as that 30 or 40 year veteran that's been on the job. So that's the power of the technology that we provide today to our customers. Uh, commercial, we're currently working with like DuPont. Uh, we've worked with all of these companies in the past and currently, so, yeah, there's a few of them. Any questions about any of those? Okay. So, um, yes, ma'am. My first is was BAE. BAE Systems was our first customer, and actually, um, on my I think on my next slide on my talking points, I was going to tell you that story. <laughs> um, our markets: uh, VOD, government, healthcare, medical. Um, education, museums, uh, enterprises, and manufacturing solutions. So when we say DOD government, as you know, providing solutions and technology that help our military and our government to make smart decisions to keep our soldiers and troops safe on the battlefield. When we talk about healthcare or medical, um, our previous customer, you should have saw the Portsmouth Naval Hospital. We developed a virtual reality physical therapy app for people that suffer from vertigo and motion sickness. So, um, and actually that was, that's also an industry for us because they're early adapters. So in business, you have to understand where the money is being spent. And the medical field has been early adapters of the VR, AR technology. So naturally it's only smart for us to kind of do things in that industry. Um, education and museums are that, that industry is growing with the technology. There are certain museums you can go into today and have a self-guided tour through like an augmented reality app. Um, we're doing some stuff in Fort Monroe right now. Uh, we were in the, we were working, COVID kind of stopped it, but we were doing some work with the, um, the Williamsburg Foundation for history stuff in Williamsburg, utilizing this technology. So that's one of our areas. And of course, enterprise, and manufacturing. So companies like DuPont that we're working with or um, you know, Dominion Energy or companies like that, 
that requires some sort of um, advanced technology to help train their personnel and their staff or to help increase safety or awareness on a job site or any of those areas where this technology is very beneficial. So struggles and successes. This is gonna be a fun slide. So when you start a company or a business or when you decide to take that entrepreneurial journey, most of us, I'm not gonna say 100%, but I'm gonna say 99% of us, the first issue or hurdle we have to cross is having access to capital. You need money, right? So all of us are full, are full of a ton of great ideas, um, but a lot of us are not able to execute on those ideas due to lack of funding. So you have to learn how to navigate that. Um, I've learned here today, if I had to do it all over from where we are right now, I probably would have went out and tried to raise capital instead of trying to bootstrap it because the augmented reality, virtual reality industry is a new industry. So imagine getting that industry five years ago when nobody was really doing it. Um, it was very tough. And to be a small business and to move at the pace of the industry is very difficult. So if I had to do it all over again, I probably would, I would probably go out, raise capital so that way I can move quickly. Um, I read an article that my mentor shared with me that said, you have two types of company, the quick and the dead, right? So if you can't move quick um, and you need capital to move quick, you can find yourself far behind real quick. I don't care, like, I would say that five years ago, we're probably one of the leading AR VR companies in the world at that time. You know, and think about or imagine like, uh, uh, imagine a huge ship, right? So let's say I would consider ourselves being a small business. I would say we're a little small rowboat. And then let's say our competitors that we are, you know, faced with today, I will call them a huge, you know, gigantic ship. So for us to turn that little rowboat around and go in that direction, the opposite direction is easy. You have that huge gigantic ship but them to turn that huge ship around is a lot of work, right? So while, they're, while, they're, while that ship was traveling in this direction and we were able to see this AR VR industry would be very prominent, we turned our rowboat around and started going in the opposite direction. But we're going slow because we're in this paddle boat, right? So we're moving slow. We're trying to bootstrap. We're coming up with ideas. You know, we got a team in a lab. We're all working, brainstorming, but then you slowly see that huge ship start turning around, right? And that huge ship to us are the big companies. It's your, it's your Lockheed Martins, this your Booz Allen, this your, you know, your GEs, you know, those type of companies, right? So they're turning that boat, they're moving slow. Yeah, but once they turned around and they turned those engines on, flew right past us. So that's why I bring up the, the point about the two companies being, you know, quick and the dead. Um, luckily for us though, we've been able to establish ourselves as a reputable company in this industry. And we get phone calls and emails all the time of people interested in our services. So it didn't put us out. Um, but however, it does make it that much more difficult for us to grow our company, gain new customers, generate revenue. Um, business knowledge, for me personally, it's just over years. It's trying different business opportunities. And each one I've done, I've learned something different. I'm talking anywhere from home-based businesses I've tried um, all the way into having like kiosk and malls. I remember in 2008, I opened up an airbrush tattoo shop in a mall in North Carolina. I, had my, I did my first location um, right outside of Gastonia. I did my second location in Charlotte, North Carolina. In, uh, in North Lake Mall. And then I ended up opening a third one in Alabama at the time. So you say airbrush tattoos, man, at that time it was popular. I launched a business like around April is when I opened up news. I was in the newspaper, everybody, all the mom, parents were bringing their kids up to the mall, to the kiosk. We're doing, and these airbrush tattoos last like two to three weeks. They were like eco-friendly, you know, no hazardous chemicals or anything. So you could bring your look daughter up and I can put a butterfly on her shoulder and charge you 10 or $15, right? So imagine a line all day at my kiosk. So I'm like, man, we're doing good, we got this. 
So I'm hiring people. I'm, I'm working with young people. I'm hiring like young people to work at my kiosk with me. So I'm like, yeah, we're doing good. So I had this big plan of opening up like a huge like uh, storefront one day and expanding to different states. So towards the end of the summer, I started noticing business slowing down real fast. Then school went back in, business slowed down real fast. Then October time came and it's cold. Nobody's showing their arms and legs, right? So then I realized, wait a minute, I got a seasonal business. This is not anything that I can, that can, I, I can sustain year round. So I was smart enough during that time to pivot. So then I pivoted to like birthday parties, bar mitzvahs. Um, I got a contract with the city working like the state fair. I started doing things like that, but now it became more challenging because now you just introduce a whole new level of dynamics, a whole new uh, level of logistics that are incorporated with it now. Um, not, I'm not even thinking about the legal part of it, going in people's houses. What if one of my people got hurt? Um, what if one of the kids got a hold of my air gun and did something crazy with it? So, you know, that's the whole part of it. But you figure those things out as you go. Um, but those are the type of things. So when you start a business, definitely look, learn your industry, uh, look at it very closely, try to think about everything you can, like what are the worst case scenarios? What are the best case scenarios? Um, certifications, I would tell you to always try to get certifications or do things that can legitimize your business, that can make you, um, you know, an expert in whatever it is you're doing. So whether it's personal certifications, whether it's certifications for your business or your staff, always pay attention and look at that. And then the challenging part is finding talent, right? So you got this great idea. You may have this great product or service, but now you need people because you can't do it by yourself. That was one of the first things I learned in business or being an entrepreneur. You need a team. You need a winning team. There ain't no way in the world you can do anything by yourself. It's just, I mean, I'm not gonna say you can't. Some people do it, but burnout is real, right? So I seen those people and a year or two later, they throw their hands up, may have made good money and everything, but you burn out. You have no life, no social life, uh, no time for yourself, your family, friends, whoever. So I would say always try to find good talent and uh, find a team. One of the best things we did was we found a mentor. Right. So we found a mentor who was very successful and not doing the same exact thing, but was doing things that kind of our, our businesses kind of correlate as far as like services and things that we were doing. So that mentor, very successful, 30 years in business, was able to kind of take us under their wing and teach us a lot more about business. Um, I would tell you that one of the biggest takeaways from my mentor is infrastructure. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how good your product is. I don't care how good your staff is. If you have a weak infrastructure, you will fail. There's no way you can scale appropriately in order to maintain that operation or that business, right? So infrastructure is very, very important. So what is infrastructure? So we're talking HR. We're talking finance and accounting. We're talking legal. You know, we're talking all, you know, HR training. We're talking all of those, that, the, the main infrastructure things that a lot of us don't think about or even me, myself, early on, it's like, man, I can't afford that. Well, you can't not afford it in order to be in business, right? So you have to really find ways. And, and again, learn your resources in your, in your locality and where you're from, go to your city, go to university, go to, go to ODUs. Go to your you know, local schools and universities. There are a ton of resources out there. Um, we ended up um, getting a lottery to take a entrepreneur class at ODU in 2015. So we didn't have to go through the lottery pit because guess what? I was a veteran. So guess what? All veterans automatically got in. You didn't have to worry about being a lottery pit. That was a $10,000 course that I took for free right here at ODU. And we learned a lot about business. We learned that they brought in experts in government contracting. They brought in attorneys. They brought in other business, small business owners, owners in the area. That was a very beneficial course for us because that opened our eyes to a lot of different things that we weren't thinking about.
Um, so I definitely contributed to ODU. I forget what that program was called. I don't know. I don't think it no longer exists. But it was a state grant. It was a grant, you know, that came down. ODU got it. But um, kudos to that program because that really helped them. Not just me. It helped out a lot of the other people that was in that class with us. Some people found out that in that class that you think you got a business, you don't have anything. But that's okay. That's the time to find those things out. Um, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Don't try to don't try to keep something alive and prolong the inevitable, knowing that man nobody's gonna buy this thing. This is this is super hard. You know, it's gonna be difficult. Um, management and leadership is very important. Um, where's my phone? I left it. Can you grab my phone? There's a quote in there I want to read on my phone. Um, they came from Colin Powell. Somebody shared it with me recently, and I've just been adopting this quote and applying it to myself, my business. So this quote, photos. So Colin Powell is no longer with us. He passed away last year after complications with COVID. But one of he, 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 made, he made a statement. It says that leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help or concluded you don't care. Either case is a failure of leadership. Colin Powell. I read that and that was completely important to me. Um, I think culture and leadership is very important to any organization. You have to make sure that your place of business is a place that people like coming to work. You know, people enjoy coming to work. They know that there may be challenges or adversities we face, but together we're all, we're all in this together. We're going to support each other. We're going to stand by one another. We're going to work very hard, and we're going to come in every day and do our best. And a great leader understands that. A great leader listens, uh, you know, evaluates, um, and makes themselves available to their workers or their team. So I think uh, management and leadership is very important. Um, if you don't know how to lead, it's okay to say so. Um, again, it's about resource management. It's about resources. There are a lot of resources in the community that you can go to. I'm talking anywhere from, anywhere from workforce development to SCORE is a great one. It's a free service that anybody can go get accounting classes from, how to set up your books, you know, all kind of stuff, how to write, properly write a contract. All of those things are there, are, are out there. So definitely just do your due diligence. Um, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask. A closed mouth don't get fed, right? So uh, tuck that pride away, uh, tuck the shyness away, and don't be ashamed to come knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I need help. I don't understand how to do this. I do it all the time. If I don't know, I'm not going to pretend I know. So. The other one is, um, I would say, protecting IP and proprietary information. If your product or service is something unique to you or something you created, it is very important that you protect that. Um, and again, that could be costly, depending on what it is. But there are ways to do so. So um, definitely, I've seen where people have something proprietary. I've said they protected it so much they can't do no business, right? They're not getting any business. So there is a fine line, but you have to be very careful. I remember I went to a seminar in Virginia Beach, and the founder of MapQuest was there. And the first thing he said was, um, if I have to sign an NDA to talk to you, I don't want to talk to you. And I didn't understand that at first. I'm like, well, an NDA kind of helps protect my idea or concept. But then when you really look at it, what he's saying is, if you're coming to me for help, you know how many people come to me for help? You know how many NDAs I have to sign every day? I'm not going to keep up with that. Either you want the help or you don't, right? Because so, he runs an entrepreneurship center down in, um, it's in North Carolina, um, a, huge, a huge entrepreneurship center there, I think outside of Raleigh in that area, in the research, in the research triangle. But uh, they deal with entrepreneurs every day. It's a huge program. So 
because somebody don't want to do an NDA with you, don't it doesn't mean you're not protected. You as the owner, you just be careful or find unique ways to make sure you know how to explain what it is you're trying to do, your product and your services, in a way to where you know you're still protected. Because at the end of the day, your idea is your idea. It's very difficult for someone to take your idea because I'm not in your head. I don't know what you're thinking. I can say, oh, I heard that she wanted to start a hydroponic garden. Okay, what does that mean to me? And she wants to do all of these things with it. I'm not in, I don't know your ideas. I'm not in your head. And I probably don't even have the, the bandwidth or my capacity to understand what you're trying to do. So just because you told me your idea, don't mean I'm going to go run and do it. And even if I try to run and do it, nine times I'm a t out of 10, I'm going to fail anyway, right? So, but um, it is important to protect your IP, your intellectual property, or any proprietary information related to your, you know, unique entrepreneur, you know, product, service, whatever it is you want to provide. And again, like I said, developing a winning team. Um, I remember a few years back, we had a really good, talented team, but it wasn't the right team. Um, and it came to a point where we pretty much had to do a reset and bring in a whole new team. That was very difficult. It was very challenging. But it was one of those things where um, do I sit and cry about it and focus on what to do, how, you know, what I should have did, what I could have did, or do I take that time and energy and I regroup and I make myself stronger than I was before. And that's exactly what we did. Um, you know, the previous crew was very talented, but very good. But at the end of the day, you know, God has a plan and everybody has their season in your life. So always remember that. So just because you may start out of business with somebody, don't mean you're gonna end in business with that person, right? So if you kind of mentally prepare yourself for that, um, that'll help you out you know, throughout your, you know, entire entrepreneurial journey. Just know that, you know, everybody is not meant to be where you are. Everybody is not meant to be an entrepreneur. And you, some people need to dig deep within themselves and understand that. So as bad as I want to start this business, am I the right person to do that? And I got people, I know people that have found out in that journey that, hey, you know what? Running a business is not for me because it does take a certain type of mindset and mentality. Right, it does take, uh, you do have to come out your comfort zone. There are a lot of risk involved. So it does make you uncomfortable. And if you're not comfortable with being uncomfortable, it could be very challenging to be an entrepreneur. The, the, there are a lot of lonely nights. There are a lot of, <laughs> a lot of sleepless days. Um, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I remember the days where I was doing 17, 18 hours a day trying to get the company off the ground. Oh, up all night trying to learn how to write a proposal, you know, trying to understand this government database and how it's so difficult. But then I learned there's resources for that. They have these, they have these offices all around the country where you can go get help for that. Why am I trying to figure it out? There are people out there. So then I got smart and I go, I do my best to find any resource I can first before I try to do something myself because they're out there. So you learn to work smarter and not harder you know, as you go, you know, go down that journey of being an entrepreneur. Let's see. So success is, this is me in the White House. Our firm got awarded the top minority technology firm in the United States. And we got called to the White House to, re, you know, President Donald J. Trump issued us that award along with um, Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross at the time. So great accomplishment. Um, not, you know, you typically don't talk politics and business, but I did not vote for him. But uh, it still was a great achievement. I would say, so to be in military and to me, you just respect the office, regardless of who's in it. Um, we're going to have some good ones. We're going to have some bad ones. But at the end of the day, we all need to stay and try our best to remain united. So although a lot of us didn't agree, or some of us did, some of us didn't agree with a lot of things he was doing, at the end of the day, it's us as the people need to come together and sit together and remain united for ourselves, for our families, and for our friends, and for this country. So being a veteran, I understood the, and respected the office. There were people who denied going <laughs> when we got, I mean, one guy didn't have a choice. Um, this individual um, was the top minority firm for franchise, I'm not going to say the franchise name, 
but for a franchise that we all know and have eaten at around this world, around this country. Um, their board called him the day of the event and said, you will not go. Now, why would they do that? You know, they say you're not supposed to talk politics and business, but that particular franchise knew the potential negative effect it could have had on their entire corporation due to all of the things that were going on in the country at that time. So I sat back that day and I was like, man, like, why would they do that? Why would they stop him from going out and getting this, you know, highly achieved award? But then when you think about it from the company's aspect, they said a lot, you know, I'm like, okay, the last thing they want is people protesting, people quitting, people on social media slamming them because of that current climate that we all were living in. It was just a very clouded, you know, political climate at the time. Um, and it was just, so then from a business standpoint, you think differently. You know, if I didn't have a business, I'd be like, oh man, that's, that's crazy. Why they do that to him? Um, but when you own a business, you have to think differently. Um, your actions are definitely different. You're more open-minded to things. Um, you try not to be so judgmental. Um, you try to find the reason and why things are being done. And I, re I remember even just being an employee, sometimes we were like, man, why do they gotta do this? This is dumb, this is so stupid, right? It don't make sense. I mean, some of you all probably do that now. Why, why is my professor making me do this? This is like dumb, but it's because there's a, there's a bigger sight picture that you don't see. So then when I, even when in the military, when I first went into the military, I'm like, man, this is dumb, this is stupid. Why do we have to do this? But then when I became a non-commissioned officer, I'm like, oh, okay. Now I see why they was making us do this. Um, and it's just one of those things where, you know, um, everybody doesn't need to know everything until a certain time, right? So things may seem stupid or dumb, or doesn't make sense to you today, um, but trust me, there's always a bigger picture or a bigger plan or a bigger mission that's bigger than you and your understanding. And when you realize that, you start to see things differently. So um, some of my talking points, marketing strategy, didn't have one. <laughs> we did not. Um, our industry was so new. The industry is still new to this day. Um, the augmented reality, virtual reality, industry is ever evolving. Um, some of you may have heard or know that Facebook is now meta for the whole metaverse. So virtual reality and augmented reality play directly into the metaverse. Um, and still, what does that mean? Do you still know what the metaverse means? It's undefined. It's gonna, I mean, it's gonna be all kinds of things. And then I think somebody else is calling it something else. I think Jeff Bezos is getting into the game now, giving it to try to do something. So it's, all, it's, a, it's an ever evolving industry. So although we're like, the technology is not new, it's just been enhanced due to, you know, um, the computing power, you know, this, your device on your hand is so powerful now. So because the computing power is there now, it's making the technology uh, more accessible to the regular everyday person uh, right in your hand, in your home versus before only large enterprises or the federal government could even, you know, do anything with this technology. So it's becoming more of a commercial, you know, software, you know, product uh, and technology. So that's the reason why you have the AR VR industry today. So we did not have a marketing strategy. We just kind of did the best we could to follow the industry um, and to adapt when the industry adapted, we had to pay very close attention and see where things were going. Like I said, early on, you know, medical was the first adapters. I think Microsoft, the HoloLens was the first augmented reality to hit that commercial that was on TV. So you got to follow that. It's like now the government um, awarded Microsoft like a, I don't know, I think it was like a three or four billion dollar contract to utilize the Microsoft HoloLens, which is an augmented reality headset for our troops. So knowing that, guess where I'm focused on <laughs> Trying to see, okay, they got to buy the, okay, they bought those headsets, Somebody got to develop the content and software to run on those things. So quite naturally for me, I'm focused in that area because I'm staying close to my industry and I'm seeing what's going on. So if you're an entrepreneur, you always do that. And I think too, a lot of people think that because someone else exists is doing the same thing you're doing, uh, that's, no, don't, don't, don't discount yourself. Just because somebody else is doing it, there's a lot of different ways 
to do a lot of stuff. There's a lot of different companies that make TVs. There's a lot of different companies that make cars, you know, so don't discount yourself because somebody else is doing what you're doing. Again, you have your own drive and motivation and your own why on why you're doing something. Um, you go to sh you watch Shark Tank. The first thing they say is, "What's your why? Why are you doing this?" Most people have a very good story on why they're doing something. They're not doing it just to be doing it. They have, they, have, they either had a sick child who was suffering from something that gave them that business idea. They either had a sick parent, you know, or something to that effect. So, a lot of business ideas come from that. Um, our first customer, <laughs> our first customer was BAE Systems. So this is a really good story. So in 2016, um, I went to DC. Uh, me and the guy, we're friends now. There was an event going on called Switch Pitch. Switch Pitch was an event where the big companies, instead of small businesses pitching their company to the big companies, the big companies were pitching their need to the small businesses. That's why they called it switch pitch. So heard about it. I registered. I think it was like $50 to $75 plus, you know, that three hour drive from Hampton Roads to DC. So the crazy thing about it was that day before, um, I was already in DC for another event. At that event is when I found out about that switch pitch event because I went to another event. So that event ended at like nine, eight, nine o'clock that evening. I, I drove, but other people came with me. So when I found out about that event, I couldn't just stay. So I ended up driving all of those people back down here to Hampton. I did a turn and burn. I turned around. I got, I got home probably, man, I probably got home one o'clock in the morning took a quick shower, changed clothes, and got in the car and drove right back to D.C. to attend this switch pitch event. That's how determined we were to try to, like, get business and get, get our first contract. Well, BAE was one of the companies at that switch pitch event. So you get there, you check in. It was right there in the Roslyn Center in D.C., if you're familiar with, you know, D.C. at all. So we go in, and I got, like, my little demo kit and everything with me. And the guy that's hosting the event says, whoa, 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 hold on. What are you doing? I said, well, this is my demo kit. He was like, no, you don't need none of that. All you need is like um, a notepad because you're only going to have like five minutes to like stand up and kind of like, it's going to be like a speed dating session. So the big company is going to be on the stage. They're going to pitch you your need. And then we have these little round tables where we're going to do like speed dating. You got like two or three minutes at each table and that's where you're going to pitch to your, your capability to the company. I said, um, man, I said, but what we have, you just can't tell it in words. People got to see it. He said, I understand, but you can't bring that in here. I said, okay, no big deal. I walked out. I thought to myself, I said, man, people got to see this. There's no way in the world, like nobody gets it until they see you. So I saw that he had walked away from the check-in table. So I grabbed my bag and went in the building and went in there and went into the room where they had everything set up. And I had this pop-up wall. You can see those pop-up banners. So I popped it up real quick and set up against the wall and then sat down. Right? So, and this guy, he'll tell you the story to the day. He tells the story to everybody. So he comes back in the room. And he's looking. He sees this thing, this big 10 by 10. Because what it was, was it was an image on this, like, 10 by 10 banner that you pop up. And then you walk up to it with an iPad. It was a piece of equipment image of a piece of equipment, you walk into it, the iPad, point the iPad at it, and the whole thing just came to life. And like, I got instructions, so an arrow is telling you to push here, press there, showing you how to operate that piece of equipment. It's like magic when you see it for the first time, because like stuff just floating in the air, right? So you're getting all your instructions, everything that way. So he's standing there, he comes in, he's kicking off the meeting, he keeps looking at this wall, like, who brought that in here? Where did that come from? I could tell he was thinking that. So during our break, um, the innovation director, the director of innovation for BAE was in the room and I knew that was him. So I said, hey, sir, are you familiar with augmented reality? He was like, nah, what is that? I said, follow me, come up to this wall. And I pulled my iPad out, my iPad out and pointed it at the wall. And he was like, holy crap, what are you doing? I said, watch this, it's gonna guide you through how to, how to flush the system 
this pump system. You never did that task before, right? He's like, heck no. I said, you're about to do it though, step by step, as though you've already done it. So he went through the whole procedure. He's like, this is, we're a $40 billion a year company. We don't have this technology. By this time, the guy walks in the room that's hosting the event. And now he, now he knows, oh, he put that up there. I have to, I told him not to. But at the, long story short, at the end of the event, he was like, I'm glad you didn't listen to me. Because after that, 30 days later, I had a quarter million dollar contract with VA Systems. Um, that quarter million dollar contract ended up going to about, um, in totality, it was about a million over a year. We did about a million dollars worth of work for VA Systems. So that's how I got my very first contract. <laughs> so that was a funny story. Um, he tells that story to this day. Um, the BAE folks tell that story to this day. So yeah, I was a little defiant. And sometimes you gotta be, I say that because sometimes you have to be in business, right? It's like, this is your livelihood. You're, you're trying to survive. I mean, I'm already been trying to get this coming out the ground. I already got like, um, already got like eviction notices on my door for my apartment. My truck was just repossessed two weeks before that because we're taking everything we have out of our entire savings to get this business off the ground. So I like, I'm, I'm like, my, my drive and determination was like, man, I'm not going to let him stop me. I know once somebody see it, they're going to want to know more about this. And it worked out for me. So we're friends to this day. We, every time we get on the phone, we laugh about it. He said, man, you just was hard here. You bought that thing in there anyway after I told you not to, but I'm glad you did. You know, I'm glad to see the success that came from that because it ended up being a success story for him. He could turn around and be like, hey, man, we did this. It was our very first Squish Pitch event where a company got a quarter million dollar contract <laughs> in 30 days. Who does that? Right. So um, our vision, we have a, oh, so let's go to the team. We have a very good team now. Um, I have a, a, a guy that works for me that was a, an elementary school janitor making minimum wage. That's now a salary employee of mine. He's a 3D modeler and graphic artist for me. Um, I, I let him come in and shadow our development team on his off time. Uh, in about 90 days, he was getting good. Six months later, he was getting really good. Wasn't paying him anything, but allowed him to come into our facility to learn. About six months later, my lead 3D artist said, hey, Jamarcus, you got to come see this. He started showing me this kid's work. And I was like, man, he's good. He's like, yeah, he's getting real good. OK, I'm going to make him a job offer. So made him a job offer initially. It's kind of like a, a graphic artist, kind of like an intro type thing, paying him $15 an hour just to see what he's, he's already only making minimum wage. So that was already helping him out. And then uh, about six months after he was in that position, he's now a full-time salaried employee, you know, making a, I don't know what he makes, 50, 60,000 a year now. Uh, he was a, he was a elementary school janitor. So for, so for us and our team, it's not about, um, it's about opportunity. Now, some people just need exposure, right? Some people are, he was, I could tell he was kind of in that phase of trying to figure out what he wanted to do in life. That industry or that field interests him, but he still wasn't quite sure that's what he wanted to do or not. So I, I allowed him to come in to see if that's something he wanted to do. Come to find out he liked it and wanted to stick with it. Uh, I think I'm getting ready to pay for some certifications for him now to continue to help him enhance and hone in his skills on being a 3D modeler and uh, animator for the company. So we do a lot in the community. I do a lot with parks and rec. I do a lot with low income areas because it's all about exposure. Um, you don't know what you don't know. How do you know if you want to be an augmented reality developer if you're never exposed to augmented reality, right? So it's one of those things where um, we, keep, we open our doors to the community. We let parents come in with their kids. You know, pre-COVID, we were doing a summer camp every year uh, in the summer where we had a contract with the city of Hampton where they would bring in a hundred something kids over the course of about a six week time period. We had different kids and uh, we would expose them to technology, programming, um, 3D printing, robotics, uh, different things just so people can see it. Uh, let me expose you to it because you don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer or go to traditional you know, career routes. Uh, this world is living off of technology now. You know, if you, left, if you left your house today and left your phone and you, was, you drove 30 minutes, you're going to turn around and go back and get it. Why? Because you're hooked to that technology. Your email is there. 
all your family and friends is on this thing. Your work. <laughs> some people got some people do work on their phone now. So it's, the world we're living in is technology driven. So we like to expose people to the world of technology to foster um, different ideas, different career ideas for people. College is not for everybody. I got a guy, I got a software developer that works for me now that never didn't even go to school for programming, self-taught. He self-taught himself watching YouTube videos and he's good. <laughs> you know, I had a kid working for, he no longer works for me now. I had a kid that was um, on a spectrum, super talented, super talented. Um, we, made, we made accommodations for him. We knew that his medication prevented him from sleeping at night. No problem, you come to work at noon. You know, we made accommodations for those people. You're not, don't discount you. You're not discounted because you may be on a spectrum or anything like, no, we welcome that. So we actually had, in fact, I think most of my staff, they'll openly tell, tell you they're either ADHD or something to that effect. Um, so what? It doesn't matter. There's no stigma here. If you have the skill set, if you want to learn, we're going to let you in so you can learn. And that's how our company operates. Uh, we're, our doors are open to the community. Uh, we're very welcoming. And we just try to we find different ways to give back. That's how we operate. Um, and that's part of our vision. Our vision is just being able to introduce the world of technology to anybody who wants to know about it. Um, and then we also try to find solutions that kind of help our world as well um, in different ways, whether it's economical, you know, the, or the economy. Um, I'm trying to figure out how we can do something to help combat global warming with the technology. You know, so trying to find good in what we do and how we do it. We, we do a lot of good now. A lot of our technology is utilized to help keep our troops safe on the battlefield, um, help major corporations train up people better to keep from preventing some sort of, you know, hazardous chemical accident on the facility. So a lot of our technology is used for good and we want to continue to do that. Um, and I would say, I would ask you to ask yourself, should you be your own boss? Nobody knows you better than you. Um, so like, again, like I was saying earlier, there are some people who want to take that entrepreneurial journey and then they find out they're not built for it. That's okay. That's where the good managers and come in at, you know, that's where that good, strong team lead. Hey, I, I don't want to run a company, but I know my stuff and I'm good at it. And I can lead a team of people in performing that task or job. Great. That's where those people come from. So should you be your own boss? You answer that question. You may not even know today. You might not know until you start the journey. And then you may not find out until you're into the journey that, hey, this is not what I want to do. This is, nah, it's too hard, it's too stressful. I just want to come in, contribute my part, and go home and be with me and my family. And that's okay too. So, any questions? Hope I wasn't too long-winded or anything. I try to give you like the real, like be open, honest about everything. So, yes ma'am. Um, currently, my favorite project is a product, a software product that we are developing called Mimic, M-E-M-I-K. It's an augmented reality dance app. Um, a partner of mine, our, both, both of our companies, it was a COVID project. Once COVID hit, my partner called me, he's in Atlanta, and he owns a tech company down there, and he says, hey, man, I got this idea. You guys do augmented reality. Everybody's stuck in the house. Well, we found a cool way, similar to TikTok, but what if I could project my avatar in your living room and I'm dancing with you in my living room? And I'm like, okay. He said, you guys do augmented reality. He said, hey, why don't we team up, man, and try something? So, all right. So all of 2020, we were, my team, his team, we all got on a conference call. And we all started started talking about this idea and how it could be done. A um, couple months later, we had a really good concept of it. By that December, we had a working prototype. Um, we did a soft launch. So if you Google Mimic, you probably see some of the old stuff. It was around Christmas. We had Christmas songs in there. And basically, the way it works is I can record you with my phone doing a dance. 
through the Mimic app. It takes that video, sends it to our server, processes it, and in about a minute, minute and a half, we get a notification back that says, hey, your animation is now ready. It turns that dance into an animation. You can then either create your own, build your own avatar, or select one that's already in the app and attach that animation to one of the characters, project it in your living room through your mobile device like a hologram, and now that person's now that character's doing that dance you just made up right there in the living room. That's how it currently functions. Um, we are about to close. We, we did it right. What I say about getting smart and having access to capital. Well, guess what? We just raised about $1.5 million to get that application off the ground. Uh, we are in negotiation with certain celebrities right now. Uh, we, have, we have launched a company on Star Engine. So if you're familiar with Star Engine, it's kind of like a fundraising, like a crowdfunding platform where you can invest in new businesses. Um, before we launched on Start Engine, the company had a $6 million valuation. Today, we have an $18 million valuation. And probably before, by the end of April, we'll probably be close to about a $100 million valuation. So um, that's been the, the, my favorite project to date right now. And it's not even my main core business. That's kind of like a side project that even my current staff. So we, again, we talk about developing that winning team. Our staff was able to get equity in that company. So in their off time, they continue to work and develop on that project. Um, it's just been a great project to work on. It's fun seeing it evolve, go from an idea to now we raised about $1.5 million for it. And um, we think that uh, we, one of our biggest accomplishments is the global head of marketing for Snapchat just got approved to be on our advisory board. That was strategic. That's all strategy. Um, so there's a lot of good things uh, about to happen. So be on the lookout for Mimic, M-E-M-I-K. It's like TikTok on steroids. So it's not just a video. You're actually interacting with a virtual avatar that you can dance with. You know, I have a, afterwards, I can show you a couple examples on my phone of how the technology works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last two years, there's been a lot of like pop up AR VR companies now, right? Because everybody see the industry is taking off. It's the biggest buzzword today in technology is augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, I remember when we were doing it, Pokemon Go wasn't even out yet. So shortly after we started making headway in the industry, Pokemon Go came out. And then people were like, oh, that's augmented reality. And we're like, well, kind of, sort of. That's a game. We're taking that same technology, though, but we're teaching people how to perform their job, work instructions. We're teaching somebody how to be you know, more safe on the job site. We're, you know, we're doing HR training with the technology, you know, things like that. So. Um, once COVID hit, you have seen a lot of companies pop up that say they do AR, VR. Um, it did slow us down because, like I said to you earlier, people don't really get it till they see it. So COVID prevented us from doing a lot of traveling. Um, I stayed on the road a lot doing, like, you know, uh, demos on sites. Like, I'll go to Florida, I'll go to, you know, Maryland, wherever, and do an on-site demo to a, a corporation. And they're like, oh, yeah, we want this. But we weren't allowed to do that during COVID. So it slowed us down in that area. Um, and let's, I'm glad you asked that question, too. So I got a very good point to bring up in reference to that. Once you know your industry, make sure that you kind of have a good balance. I guess it depends on what you're doing. So for us, because we do government and commercial, I always try to have like 50% government and 50% like commercial work. It's kind of what I strive for. So in government, our government contract got signed February like 27th. COVID hit like that first week of March. My government contract got signed just in time versus all my commercial work came to a screeching halt, right? So because I had this government work and I already had this contract, and if you know how government work, funding, once a project is awarded, all the funding's already been allocated, the money's already in the bank. So we got paid for performing that work month after month. And that allowed me 
as a small business to keep our doors open, to not lay anyone off. So our entire staff stayed employed the entire time. But it could have very well been the opposite. What about when, like now, when government is doing all these budget cuts and funding cuts um, and government slows down? Well, I'm trying to make sure I got commercial work. So when, when any one of those segments take a hit, I try to have a good balance of work to where we can continue to maintain and operate as a business. So um, I hope that answers your question. You were talking about different companies popping up during COVID and things like that. But yeah, we've seen a lot of companies pop up. There's a lot of competition out there now that wasn't there before. Luckily for us, though, we have the past performance and experience. So we have been called. There, there have been two opportunities that we won contracts for where they hired another company, the other company didn't perform, and then we got contacted to kind of come in and clean up and actually deliver. So I definitely pride our company on being able to deliver because, I mean, we're not just saying, we just, we just didn't pop up during COVID. You know, we've been in business since 2013. We've been doing this a while. We know the industry very well. We have a and I do my best to make sure we have relationships with the hardware manufacturers like HTC Vive, um, Microsoft, Daiquiri, Unity. You know, we have partnerships with these companies as well in the industry. So then we get referred by the manufacturers or the other, the other organizations. Hey, contact JNF. I know this guy can develop the content that you need for that headset. So it works out in our favor. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you select the right family members, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, I do. I have my aunt. She's a admin to the CEO. Um, and just so y'all know, the CEO is my wife. So she's the woman owned, minority owned, serving to say we're veteran. We're both veterans, but um, so she's her admin. Um, it's good because family always, the right family member always has your back. So she's always looking out. Hey, you need to pay attention to this or. Hey, you need to go correct that or, you know, something to that effect. So it's been good um, when you have to fight the right family members. I've seen it go bad real fast when you don't have the right family members. So, but no, it's been really good. Yes. I can't hear you. Um, we have made games before. Yes, we made games before for people. That's not like our go-to, I guess, business strategy, um, but we have. I guess you can say, I guess you can consider a meme like a game in a way. Yes. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to, I try to do things outside of my core business, like, um, me and my friends now are launching a cigar company. So I'm integrating technology into that. There's a reason why I'm doing it that way. Um, I try to do other things to keep me busy that I enjoy doing and that I have fun doing. I have fun with that company. It's another side project, but I have fun doing it. Um, I do volunteer work. I am. Um, I have a technology team for our local N NAACP office, where um, we're providing technology support to them. Like we are updating the website, we're getting ready to build them a mobile app, uh, things like that. So that keeps me busy and fun. Um, travel. I love traveling, even though COVID kind of brought that to a halt. My latest hobby is playing with my Tesla. I love it. So. I find every excuse. Hey, you need me to go to the store? No, you don't need to drive that car. But um, yeah, I, I, I do try to wind down. I try not to bring work home. Although if you're an entrepreneur, you know you're always on the clock, right? You're never off the clock. But you do it in a way that's manageable to you know your own mental health and lifestyle. So I try. I know about burnout. I used to do that. Uh, I don't do that anymore. I had to learn the hard way. Um, I had an incident with my health when I was, before I started the company, I was working with my previous employer 
and I was working 16, 17 hour days just to make sure things were right. Um, I was in Iraq at the time and it was just, we had to go to these different, I, cause I was on a program called, um, I won't say the name, but it was a program where we had to install technology on all the different military bases to keep our soldiers safe. And I just knew how important it was to get that technology out there. So, I mean, I was working around the clock cause I don't want another incident happening where we lose a soldier. So me and my team, I, I mean, and throughout the night, I'm sitting there planning, doing all the logistics, doing all the inventory to make sure I got the parts and equipment so when we get there, we can knock it out. And um, one day I ended up getting medevac because my heart was just like, you could see my heart pounding through my chest. So I went into the, the clinic just to make sure I was good. And uh, they brought in the EKG machine and hooked me up to it and was like, oh, this machine is broken. So they went and said, let us get another one. So they got another machine, <laughs> rolled it up with it, and it was like, this one can't be broke too. So the third time, the major, the, the army medical major came in and hooked me up to the EKG machine. And the first thing he said was, you're getting medevac. Um, so for whatever reason, at the end of the day, the cardiologist said, I'll stress myself out. He said, you're working too hard. You stressed everything out. So I ended up getting medevac out of Iraq, back to the United States. Um, I was living in North Carolina at the time, so I had to see a cardiologist in Charlotte. Had to wear a heart monitor for six months. I wasn't clear to go back to work for, for a year. And at the end of the day, it was just one of those things where I just stressed my body. I don't have, it wasn't like I had a medical condition that stuck with me for a lifetime, but he said, if you keep working like that, you will have a permanent medical condition. Slow down, get your body rest. So after that, I kind of learned to not work that way. Although occasionally I catch myself going there, but I don't do that too often these days. I try to cut it off, you know, when I get home. Any other questions? Yeah, no. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's it.